Welcome everybody to True Exact Show. I'm here with two huge Eagle fans, Nick oh. F., my brother Raymond, and we're here with the voice of the Philadelphia Eagles, me as a Cowboy fan. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I am a huge fan as well of the one, the only, Merrill Reese. How are you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm well. I'm well. It was a beautiful <laughs> afternoon. I played about 18 holes of golf, and here I am. That's, that's awesome. Uh once again, it's really an honor you're joining us. So, like, before we get into some questions here, uh, I just have to say, um, as someone, uh, Ray and I grew up, I mean, I mean, listening to you all the time, he'd always listen to Eagles on the radio, and I wouldn't be able to control the radio station. So he'd be like, this is the greatest voice of all time. And I, I always mimicked you when I was playing video games. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> as well. I always try. We always we always talked about the 2006 game with Trent Cole, Trent Cole, where he had the pick six versus the Giants, I believe. One of the greatest yeah. calls of all time. Uh, before we get into some stuff, though, I know that they're chomping at the bit here. Let's talk about your your you getting into radio and how you ended up in Philadelphia, if you don't mind. Wow, that that that's a story that will take the rest of the night and part of tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I'll make it as brief as I possibly can. Great. Uh, people go. say I have my dream job. Uh, <laughs> my dream job really was to quarterback the team. But at five feet eight and 140 pounds, that wasn't going to happen. Mm. And I realized that early in my life. And uh, I, I majored in communications at Temple University. I uh, became sports director of the college station. I did play-by-play -play of all the big five games, Temple football, Temple baseball, anything they did, I did the play-by-play. -play. I was sports director for my sophomore, junior, and senior year. I had a stint. Uh, in the Navy, I was a Naval Public Affairs Officer. Uh, when I came out of the Navy, I was, uh, I, it took me about a year to find a job. I went around to all the stations in Philadelphia, and they said, uh, we have nothing. And then I went to the, uh, to the outlying stations, and uh, there was nothing there. I auditioned at a station in Coatesville, little town of Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and they told me I couldn't start there, that I had to go someplace small. And I, I didn't know if there was anything smaller than Coastal. But eventually I found myself auditioning in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And I had been out of the Navy about a year. And the uh, station manager looked at me and he said, you know, I need somebody to do a game on a Saturday afternoon. And I give you a chance, but you look like you'd have a nervous breakdown. And I said, you're probably right. And I went home, and that Friday afternoon I got a call, and he said, listen, it, I can find nobody else to do this game. It's between you and dead air. And so I went up to Potsdam, and uh, a little shaky at the beginning, but as the game went on, it all came back to me. And Monday morning he called and offered me a full-time job. Mm. He said, you can start tomorrow morning, Alan. And I said, my name is Merrill. <laughs> and he said, no, son Alan likes to hear his name on the air. So, you know, I was just glad that his daughter, that daughter Betty didn't have an ego problem. <laughs> so I, I went and I did the games and did the, everything in Potsdam, the disc jockey show. I did a show in Potsdam called Highland Garden of Memories, where they played organ music and I read death notices. And I said, wow. Wow. boy, I said, how am I ever, you know, when I was in college, they told me that everything is a learning experience and will come in handy someday. And I said, this will never come in handy. How did I know that that would get me prepared to do the last year of Chip, Chip Kelly's stay in Philadelphia? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I did everything there. Then I moved to WBCB in Levittown, where I primarily did news. And uh, that is a station I'm proud to say that I am now managing partner wow. of Good. one of the owners of WBCB radio and online television in Levittown. And uh, so I was there for a couple of years, came into the city to WWDB, um, auditioned at WIP. Their sportscaster was a guy named Charlie Swift, and he would take a month's vacation every year, summer vacation. And WIP was the station. They had the largest uh, profit margin of any station in the country. And um, so I went in and I auditioned in February. 
And I didn't hear anything. And I figured, well, nothing's going to happen. And then uh, about uh, April, the beginning of April, I got a call. And they said, we want you to come in and do another audition. And I came in and I did another audition. And I knew he was going in June for vacation. And I heard nothing. And finally, I got a call. And they said, we'd like to speak with you. Come on in. So I'm sitting in the lobby thinking it's another round of auditions and um, an interview to see what's what. And while I'm sitting in the lobby, Charlie Swift comes in and he said, come here, kid. And he takes me in the back and takes me to the studio. And he said, here's where you'll be doing my sports when uh, I'm gone for the next month. And I said, what? He said, they didn't tell you? I said, no. He said, oh, well, you got the job. There were 93 people who auditioned for that job, 93. And they gave it to me. So now I go back to WWDB because I was doing the morning sports there. Believe it or not, I would get up at 4.30, go in, do the sports at 6, 7, 8, 9. And then I would go back to where I lived and give tennis lessons until 11.30. I was a tennis pro. And then I would go back and do news all afternoon from one until seven. So when I went back and told WWDB, I was willing to give up my full-time job for a month on WIP. And they said, there's no need to do that. You can, you can still come in here, do the morning sports in WIP. So for a month, I got up at 3.30, went into WIP, did the sports until nine, then had to do interviews and prepare for the next day and then ran back to WWDB and did news from one till seven for a month. And, and I did it, and I survived. And now WIP had a disc jockey. His name was Ken Garland. He was the single biggest personality in the city, the biggest. He owned all the ratings. I mean, he had like 80% of the city listen to Ken Garland. And even growing up, he was my idol. I mean, he was, he was every, in everybody's house every morning. And so the first morning I came in and, and I did the sports from a, a desk in the newsroom. Ken Garland did his show from a studio down the hall. And I knew he would be listening to my sports. And I was plenty nervous. So I came on at five minutes past six and I delivered the sports the best I possibly could a lot of energy, and then I had to read the line. It's 10 past 6 on WIP. Time for the start of the Ken Garland show. And I didn't hear anything. It was, it was silent, and it seemed like an eternity. But it was probably three seconds or four seconds. And then I could hear his mic click, and he said these words. Wow, if I were Charlie Swift, I would hurry home from vacation mm. and my career took off because wow. if Ken Garland liked you, you had it made. By the time I left the building that day, they had signed me to do the pre and post game Eagle shows and the Ed Kayat coaches show. And, uh, and, and from there on in, uh, I was the fill in on WIP and I did the pre and post game shows for about four or five years. And then when the color man left, I ended up doing the color for uh, most of the 1977 season. And um, at that time, WWDB had become a talk station. So since I, that was, uh, I didn't have a full-time job at, WW, at WIP, I did the morning sports on WWDB. And every morning at uh, about 5 o'clock or 4.30, the disc jockey would call me to wake me up and I'd get up and drive into WWDB. So one morning the phone rang and I answered it and it was a guy named Tim Early who was a friend of Charlie Swift's. Yeah. And he called me and he said, Merrill, it's Tim Early. And I looked at the clock and it's like, it's like 2.30, 3.30, something like that. He said, um, I'm just calling to tell you that Charlie took his life, took his own life. Wow. So I went into w, WDB, and I did a beautiful, beautiful remembrance of Charlie, a eulogy, 
And then at nine o'clock when the switchboard opened, I got a call from the program director at WIP. And he said to me, Merrill, you're going to be doing the play-by-play -play this Sunday. Go get a color analyst. So, so I knew somebody in the city who I thought would do a good job. And as a matter of fact, it's ironic that we're speaking about this because he just passed away two weeks wow. ago. And Sorry he was a that. Hall of Famer from the Green Bay Packers and then later the Dallas Cowboys <coughs> by the name of Herb Adderley, one of okay. the greatest defensive backs in history. And I said, Herb, would you come do the last two games of the season with me? And he said, sure. So for the last – so we went on the first game, which was Sunday – the 13th of December, or Sunday the 7th of December, no, the 13th, I think it was the 13th and the 11th of December, 1977. I stood in that booth waiting to go on and do the play-by-play -play of the Philadelphia Eagles. And I was scared to death. And they had all of the players on the sideline. They had a, a moment of silence for Charlie. And they all turned and face the broadcast booth. Mm. And I could feel my knees knocking. And all I could think about is, please let something come out of my mouth. And then the game began. And once the game began, I forgot about everything and just did the game. And um, I did the game. Eagles, Eagles beat the Giants 17-14. It was the first career touchdown of a young running back. Actually, he scored on a kickoff return by the name of Wilbert Montgomery. Wow. And uh, that was it. So I did the game, and then I did the concluding game, but tapes were coming in from all over the country, mm -hmm. and they were auditioning people, and it wasn't until the following March that they called and told me that I had been selected to be the new play-by-play -play voice of the Eagles and sports director of WIP. And for the last 44 years, that has been the story of my life. That is an I, unremarkable I, you, you thing. A short story and I gave you 15 minutes. No, that's say, fat. Yeah, I'll say, if anyone who watches this want to know why they're not successful, you haven't woke up at 3, 4, 5 in the morning and given <laughs> tennis lessons in the same day. That's yeah. why. <laughs> What an amazing it, was, it wasn't easy, but you know what? I, I can honestly tell you that in my 44th year of doing the Eagles, I love it as much as I ever have. I will do it forever. I will never willingly retire. I love doing it. And I still get nervous on game day until they cue me and I go on with the game because it means so much to me. But I, I, I pinch myself every time I go to that broadcast booth and say, you know what? There is no place in the world I would rather be and nothing in the world I would rather be doing. Right. Now, I, I, I want to yeah, pass it to you guys because I know, like, I have some questions, but I want to give it to the Eagles fans. Nick, I'm going to start with you because you're a guest as well, man. If you got any questions, go for it. Well, first and foremost, uh, Merrill, it's an honor to, to speak to you. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story. I uh, my, my Eagle fandom, I guess, was born out of uh, a little bit of front runnership since I, uh, I went to college at Kutztown University uh, in 2003-04. So I was there for Doug when Dennison, they... right? Doug Dennison. Doug <laughs> Dennison. Andre Hall of Famer. Kutztown. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I went to college, and obviously uh, I started when they went to the Super Bowl, uh, I guess it would be the second time against uh, – the second time in the Super Bowl, first time against the Patriots. And, um, you know, just being an Eagles fan, I live in central New Jersey, so, you know, I never got the games unless they played the uh, the Giants or they had a primetime game. And um, in talking to uh, a bunch of diehard Eagles fans and some of my friends to this day who uh, – are the reason why I became Eagles fans in the first place. They kept mentioning Merrill Reese, Merrill Reese. And uh, I kind of felt like the kid in the sandlot when he was like Babe Ruth. And everybody kind of like looked at him like, you don't know who Babe Ruth is? And it was kind of the same thing for me. And <laughs> I was like, who's Merrill Reese? And they were like, you don't know who he is? I got to be honest with you. And I, I you know, from, from that day forward, you know, I listened on the radio and more often than not, I listened to the radio and I am a millennial, an older millennial, but to, uh, 
be someone that listens uh, to the radio over watches on TV just to hear your voice is, uh, you know, I mean, says everything that, you know, I think about you and uh, an Eagles game is not an Eagles game without listening to you and your highlights. So I, I appreciate you and just wanted to thank you for jumping on as well with the rest of the Thank guys. you. And I, no, I, I, no, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. my, my history, I was five years old. My dad's a Packers fan. Brother up there is a Cowboys fan. But the Eagles played the Packers in a preseason game in like 1987. I was five years old. And the Eagles won. And I told my dad, I said, I want to be an Eagles fan. So then up until three years ago, I caused myself 30 years of just aggravation and misery until <laughs> it finally happened. And yep. it, it, it was like, see, that's what makes you so relatable to us Eagle fans is everybody would rather listen to you because we grew up listening to you. It's like your ch our childhood coming through <laughs> the speakers. But the other reason is you are everything that embodies a Philadelphia Eagles fan because you are one yourself. So the anger, the heartbreak, the emotion, everything in your broadcast is everything us fans go through and we go through it together. And I think that's why you're so relatable aside from the golden voice you got, because I always said football's your voice and Pat Summerall on TV and baseball's Vince Scully. But when I think of football, I think of Al Reese's voice. It's you're one of us. And that's why us fans relate so much to you and respect you so much. Well, I, I respect the fans so much. And that's why when I do an Eagles game, I tell you what I really think. If they're playing badly, I'll say they're playing badly. Or if I look at a replay, and even if what I see doesn't favor the Eagles, I will say it. Yeah, he stepped on the line. He he was out of bounds. Even if it's, uh, you know, e e even if it's Greg Ward. I mean, I I'll, I'll tell you what I see, and you know how I feel. You know I want them to win. You know I suffer with you, have suffered for a lot of years. Yeah. I used to tell a joke that I haven't been able to tell since February 4th, 2018. But prior to that, I told a joke. Uh, <laughs> I told a joke about a guy who was walking down the street and saw something shiny under a bush. And he pulled it out, and it was, it was a lamp, like Aladdin's lamp. And all of a sudden, a genie pops out of the lamp. And the genie says, thank you for picking me up and finding me out of that tree. I will grant you any wish. And the guy looked at the genie and said, I wish for eternal life. And the genie said, listen, everybody wishes for eternal life. You have to give me another wish. He said, okay, I wish I lived to see the Eagles win a Super Bowl and the genie said oh you're a wise one <laughs> <laughs> and I, think, see, I can't tell that anymore no because no. I love it <laughs> but that's like when it finally happened that that moment the fact that you included the fans in your announcing of the Super Bowl championship was like it was so respectful, and we appreciate that so much. You made it like we were included in it. But well, right, I, right. I have to tell you why. Because we have a morning show in town uh, on WIP with uh, Angelo Cataldi. And uh, he's the big sports yes. host in Philadelphia. And I'll go on with him at, oh, maybe 10, 12 times a year. And he'll call me. And he's always said, prior to this, he always said to me, Merrill, boy, I want the Eagles to win the Super Bowl. And one of the reasons I want them to win it is for you. Mm. I mean, don't you think that you have to have a Super Bowl win to describe, to make your career complete, even if you do it forever? And I said, no. I said, no, I don't feel that way. And the reason I don't feel that way is that I am so privileged to sit in that seat. I am so privileged to be part of the team, to travel with the team. I've had great games to describe. 
I did the miracle. I did two miracles yeah. in Meadowlands. <laughs> two. I did, I did games that were amazing. Uh, I mean, I've had so many thrills getting to know so many outstanding players, so many outstanding people. I mean, there's nothing in the world I'd rather be doing, nothing that can make me as happy. And I want the Eagles to win the Super Bowl, but I want them to win it for the fans because these fans are so loyal. They come out in any kind of weather. There are fans who have taken out second mortgages so that they can buy Eagles season tickets. There are fans who don't have much money, but they save whatever they can so that when Christmas comes, they can buy their kids Eagles jerseys or memorabilia. These are the greatest fans you could ever find. I want them to win it first and foremost for the fans. I have my thrills. Yes. Was I thrilled when they won it for me? I was thrilled because I'm one of you. So I yeah. was thrilled. But more importantly, I was thrilled because the greatest fans in football finally had their day. Yeah. Yeah. Meryl, I have to say, so they told their stories on how they became Eagle fans, which is great. So when I bailed ship, it was 1991 on Labor Day, and Cunningham hurt his leg. And I'm like, I'm five. The Cowboys got Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman. I'm out. So I'm bailing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I was like. So I want to venture into that. You so, have so if, it, so if it weren't for Bryce Pop in <laughs> yeah. Green Bay, You'd probably still be an Eagles fan. I, and you know what? I, I wouldn't have experienced the three Super Bowls, but I'd be happier in the recent years. But um, <laughs> I want to ask, so bringing up that, is there a time, because you said you had these great moments, memorable moments, obviously, Herm Edwards, Miracle at the Meadowlands, Deshaun Jackson, second Miracle at the Meadowlands. Uh, I bring it back to, like, was there any time, like, you saw, like, uh, as you were announcing, a devastating moment like the Cunningham injury or – a, a fourth quarter loss that you could remember where like you were equally as let down as a fan as you were high up as the miracle at the Meadowlands that you could remember. Black oh, there, Sunday. There were a lot of those. I mean, last, last passes of the game where the Cardinals or somebody mm. drew oh, a pass yeah. and somebody jumped up and took the ball away from the Eagles. Or we had so much going into Super Bowl 15 mm. in New Orleans in January of 1980. And to see right at the beginning of the game, Ron Jaworski throwing an interception to Rod Martin. I mean, you, the, all those things hit you over the years. Or you see important players hurt. I mean, I have to tell you, I, and I'll be really honest with you, when Carson Wentz went down in 2017 <laughs> at the Los Angeles Coliseum, yeah. I thought, and, and, and he was... At that point, he was the MVP of the league. Absolutely. And this 100%. team, was, this team was, was ripping off the wins. I said, that's yep. it. And, he, and, you know, they'll win the division. And Nick Foles will get them through. But there goes the Super Bowl. Oh, to our wonderful wonder guys did appear. Winning the NFC Championship game reception Falcons in the first round of the playoffs. Then they had that great win against the Vikings, right. and then of course, what we all know is the win over the Patriots. Right. No, I was I was at both those playoff games. I've been to a ton. I was at the fourth and one game in '95 when we beat Dallas with the yeah, the yeah. fourth and one call. Yeah. Um, the fourth and twenty six game I was at. I was at both playoff games the year of the Super Bowl run. What is the Can loudest? Can I tell you something, Ray? Uh, my, my vantage point in that fourth and sixth, 26 playoff game against the Packers was right on the yard line where Freddie Mitchell made the catch. Fred X. He didn't make it. I, I, I say to this day, really? usually, usually the Eagles get the, get the bad break. Freddie Mitchell, they got, they got the best spot. Wow. And that was before you could. That was before right. you could challenge a spot. But I am. I am sure to this day that he was three quarters of a yard short. That's really um, interesting. Actually. I gotta go rewatch that play now. Right, I plan on watching it too. <laughs> yeah. My father's gonna be pissed at that. <laughs> well, no, he should be happy. They still got. They still got the first down. 
Yeah. yeah. No. But the um, now, what's the loudest you've ever heard that stadium? Was it the NFC Championship game? Yeah, yeah Minnesota. The, the flea, that flea flicker to Tory Smith. Oh my to, God, that was it. To me, was the loudest I've ever heard that place. Me where too. I was, I was in the Torque Club. That Torque Club, like right in the forty yard line, you felt everything vibrating at that point. It was. And I remember looking at my friend. And I'm like, I've never felt this stadium like this because it yeah, was one too. thing. One big party the whole second half after yep, that. Yep, I know. Nick, did you want to ask? Well, I mean, I wasn't at those playoff games. I was unfortunately at some playoff yeah, games. Yeah, at all. They didn't do so well. I was at the playoff game where Mike Vick uh, should have tried, you know, should have threw it a little higher to Riley Cooper, but unfortunately intercepted by the Packers. And then, yeah, but uh, you know what? Eventually- Riley Cooper should have come back and broken that up. Yes. That should have been yeah. an interception. Yeah, you're right because he because he didn't he didn't go down right away. He took the ball and he kind of moved around and then he went down to one knee. Uh, and I was also at unfortunately Nick Foles' first playoff run uh, where they lost to the Saints. I don't have the luck that um, that Ray, Ray has. Yeah. I did want to mention one thing to you though, uh, Merrill. You mentioned WIP <laughs> Angelo, and I I do want to talk about a little bit of current. Uh, and obviously, Doug Peterson went on the show, and now obviously the the interview is a little famous due to Doug Peterson's uh, anger, uh, saying that he was pissed off. Obviously, Angelo leading in with seventy two percent of the reason why the Eagles uh, lost the game was coaching. Uh, what, in your opinion? And I know I kind of listened to a few interviews where he talked about it. It's kind of a little bit of everything. Um, but do you feel like Doug Peterson's feeling a little bit of pressure? Uh, this year being such an unsuccessful year? Uh, if, if you're saying is Doug Peterson feeling pressure about his job, the answer is no. I think okay. that Doug Peterson's a very good coach, and I think he works hard, and I think he puts pressure on himself because he wants to win every week. But even though fans get upset with the head coach, Doug is not about to become the first coach since the Super Bowl began in 1966 to be fired within three years of winning a Super Bowl. No. That's just not going to happen. He'll, he'll be fine. And Jeffrey will look at it and say, this is a crazy year with yeah. no training camp, much to speak, or no preseason games. So right. he'll be back. He's a good coach. I he's agree. got a good staff. I That's agree. not he's the reason to lose him. He, um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention on top of that was, uh, obviously, when I listened to WIP, I got to listen to the radio.com app because I'm from uh, central New Jersey. So I'm more uh, tied to WFAN and uh, Logan Ryan was on WFAN a few days ago. I don't know if you heard the interview. Uh, with I Andy. did. And he, I'm paraphrasing and I hate to do that, but, you know, basically mentioning calling out the Eagles for not working hard enough in practice, saying that the Giants are out there working in monsoons and all of those different things. And the Eagles just aren't doing that. And then reference kind of double down on it, in my opinion, and reference. He knows players on every single team, uh, almost saying that he's hearing. I, I insinuated that as him hearing from inside sources. Do you think there's any truth to that at all? No, no, I don't. Because first of all, you know, I can tell you a day in 1982, when the Eagles came back after that week, the Eagles started practice at one. And he ended practice at 8.20 under the lights. Wow. Because he said, we're going to stay out here until we get it right. And it took them, took them over seven hours of practicing before they got it right. As, as it turned out, they lost that game Sunday to the Bengals. But, but to me, the length of practice, the length of practice is dictated by the collective bargaining agreement. Right. Right. Doug can't keep them out there. Two minutes longer than they're allowed to be out there. How many times you're allowed to put pads on is dictated by the collective bargaining agreement. I believe the, the CBA agreement is in the whole course of training camp, they're only allowed to tackle to the ground twice mm. in a whole training camp. Wow. So they work as hard as any other team. They do. So I don't, I don't buy any of that. It's all... It's all dictated by the unions and by the, the CBA. I'll tell you a funny, funny story about that. Um, five years ago, there was a musical presentation called A Sportstacular at the Man Music Center in Philadelphia, which is a great big 
outdoor amphitheater for thousands of fans sitting on the lawn. And the world famous Philadelphia Orchestra did a concert of all sports themes. I mean, someone read Casey at the bat and there was music with, they, on the big screen, they, they show films from NFL films and the orchestra would play the a company uh, symphonic music. It was, it was an amazing night. So I was chosen to be the narrator of it. And I went to rehearsal one day and they were rehearsing a piece. And in the middle of the piece, this big Philadelphia orchestra, over a hundred pieces, the conductor went boom with his, with his baton and said, that's it. By the letter of the law of the unions, they would not be allowed to practice and finish the rest of that song at rehearsal that maybe had 45 seconds left in it. Wow. That's how strict these things are. Like them or don't like them, you know, but, but that's how it is in the NFL. Mm. They are dictated to by the regulations set forth by the collective bargaining association, uh, bar bargaining uh, agreement, and stipulated by the players association that he can't say we're going to stay here until we get it right. And, and neither can Joe Judge. The Eagles work plenty hard. Good. That is good I, to hear. I want, I want to ask a question because uh, obviously – I, with, my, with Raymond being an Eagle fan growing up, listen, I, I know all the greats. I, I mean, like, I'm as in, intact with Philadelphia Eagles as he is. I, I And I'm not one of these delusional fans. I respect them. I don't even hate the Eagles. Honestly, I go to games with them. I get bashed wearing a Cowboy jersey, but I, res, I respect them. I was one of the few defendants of McNabb. I love McNabb. But uh, I know Raymond is a huge Brian Dawkins fan. Uh, that's his favorite Eagle of all time, one of them. I have to ask you. Who and Nick, I guess, I have to ask you, who's the most beloved eagle you've ever seen there? Whether it's uh, like even a third stringer or something like Papale or Dawkins, like who's the most could walk into a bar in Philly and like everyone just comes to him like a Brett Favre in Green Bay? Yeah, it's Nick Foles. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've got the number nine. Yeah. You know, I, I think that might have been the case in February of – of 2018 <laughs> but, but 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 long term i i don't think anybody was ever more beloved in this town than brian dawkins yeah. i i think Dawk Dawk is right up there i mean we'll forget about the the ancient eagles the tommy mcdonald's and the chuck Bednarics, but that was a different age but of the of the post vermeil year eagles i i think i really think that dawkins was right up there. Um, he really connected with the fans in a very, very special way. Um, I, I, he, he, there was, I'll tell you another one who was loved by this, by this city, and that was Reggie White. Yeah. Oh, wow, Reggie yeah. White. Reggie White was beloved. My, my partner in the booth, Mike Quick, was, we, yeah, we yeah. go to a game and yeah. we look down there and we see a lot of 82s with Quick. Uh, he was one of them. Uh, no quarterback, because the most popular person in a city is generally the backup quarterback. Yeah. I mean, the worst he was the quarterback they were calling for Joe Archie. And, you know, Randall, they wanted Rodney Pete or Ty Detmer. Yeah. And, and with the, you know, that, but they're always calling for the backup quarterback. Right. But uh, you're but getting that now. That's just called. Part of the position, but I, 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 I honestly believe that you're probably as good as it gets because he wore his 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 heart on his sleeve, and he hit like a ton of bricks. Uh, bricks. Yeah, now, yeah. now keep in mind, and I mean this, that Dawkins couldn't do those things today. No. Dawkins no. couldn't do them. Ed Reed couldn't do them because they'd be whistled for unnecessary roughness each time, or or hitting a. Um, a, a receiver who was not protected, you know, yeah. and they, they'd be, they, they'd be getting 15 yard penalties every, not every time, but, but a lot of the things that made them great and popular are now outlawed. Now, who was, now who was your like least favorite player to cover? I don't know if you can say the name, you can give initials or whatever, but like, who was like your least favorite player as an Eagle that 
you would like that just did not click with anybody? Well, I'll, I'll give you the name. I'll give you the name. I'll give you the number. I'll tell you when. It would be Terrell Owens, because as what? great as Yo. he was, and he was as great a player as you will ever find. He yeah. was a wow. magnificent, magnificent yeah. athlete. And I will tell you that in, 2000 and, um, in, in 2003, he was amazing. But the next year, in yeah, 2000, yeah. Oh, no, 2004, four, four, he yeah. was amazing. That was the year they went to the Super Bowl. He got hurt. He came back. But the following year, he was so incensed that when people were wondering whether or not he'd come back for the Super Bowl and Donovan McNabb had all these press conferences and they'd say, Donovan, what are you going to do if T.O. can't come back? Well, what's Donovan supposed to say? Right. Well, without T.O., yeah. we're garbage. We can't right. win. Donovan would say, well, we have, we have good receivers and somebody's got to step forward. And, and Tio had such an unbelievable ego that the following year he came back and he divided that locker room like nobody I have ever seen. I have never seen any one player so destroy a locker room like Terrell Owens. Wow. So he would be my least favorite. I, I, well, go on, Raymond. Go on. No, go ahead. That's I want to a... say, too, just because, uh, yeah, I was going to ask that. Now, I, I, I would have guessed Mike Zordick. Personally, but that's just me. <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike Zordick is what? No, it's your least favorite, but that's just me throwing out a random name. Oh, Mike, Mike Zordich was a great guy. No, I'm he kidding around. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kidding around. He had I, a great mustache. I, I had so many I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, see, I have different categories. Do you know the most exciting eagle there ever was? That's uh, what I was going to ask you. Cunningham. Oh, by far. Yeah, he, he had his own TV show. He had his own TV show. Oh, right? he had his own everything. Yeah, I mean, Randall Cunningham was on Sports Illustrated. They called him football's ultimate weapon. I mean, you remember the ninety-three yard punt against the yeah. Giants? Yes. Remember yes. the the Ramblin' Randall show? Oh, the throw against Buffalo that he did. Another, another. I'll give you another great one and another great guy, Eric Allen. Yep. Oh my God! Still one of the best. Still one of the best interceptions ever against the Jets. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a couple of other guys that I absolutely got to know and really loved. One was Jim McMahon. He didn't like the media, but we got along really well, and we sat together on the plane, and he had me into tears with the stories he could tell. (laughs) And the other one, the other one, great story. here in the Reese household, we love dogs. We've had two dogs. The breed is called a Bouvier de Flanders. I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're, they're kind of like giant schnauzers, about 120 pounds. And we had one, Bruno, who lived to the age of seven. And we had one named Coach, who lived to the age of nine. Big, wonderful dogs. Love dogs. Yeah. And when the Eagles got Michael Vick, I was so upset. Right, right, right. And I... I, you know, because of the whole dog thing. And uh, I couldn't believe it. And during his first year, I really didn't have any interaction with him at all. So in the second year, uh, Kevin Cobb gets hurt in the first game against the Lions, uh, against the Packers. Packers. And Mike goes in and plays well. And the second week, they decide to start Michael Vick against the Lions in Detroit. So I get off the team bus when we get to Ford Field. And as I'm walking uh, into the stadium, I I look to my left, and there's Michael Vick. And I said, hey, Mike, have a great game. You know, I'm being polite. And he said, thanks, Merrill. And I, I, I didn't even know how he knew my name. But he said, thanks, Merrill. So now the game ends, and we're walking down the tarmac to get to the plane, to go home. And again, Michael Vick is right near me. I said, boy, did you have a good game. Are you playing as well now as you did in Atlanta? And he said, better. Because when I was in Atlanta, I thought I knew everything. He said, this is my, this is my last chance. Right. And I, I am doing everything. I am studying. I am working like I've never worked before in his life. But let me tell you something. Michael Vick did more things to repent 
Yeah. He would do things for the SPCA, for the Humane mm -hmm. Society. He would speak at schools. He did everything he could. He became, he became one of the real pillars of the community. Everybody in the locker room loved him. Yeah. He turned his life around like nobody I have ever seen. And to this day, I will think of Michael Vick as one of my favorite all-time Eagles. And I will tell you this. I have never seen anybody spin a football and throw a pure yeah. spiral than Michael Vick. All in a flick of a wrist, too. Like it's it's yeah. like he doesn't even. I'll say, I'll say that Merrill too, because like I, I'm sure we all I'm dog lovers too. When it happened, yeah, we all are. In 2007, yeah. when this happened, I was disgusted. You heard the um, you heard the the the, the details of what went down. Yeah. Like, oh my God, this is horrible. But. Yeah, I believe in second chances. Like, and you know what? He, I ended up being a fan of his. I started room for him because, like, enough's enough. He did. I genuinely believe he was a good person who just did something stupid. You know, and I think there's a lot well, of people. I, like, I, I think, I think it was part of the culture, mm -hmm. in correct, in which he grew right. up. Right, right, and, and it yeah. was an everyday thing. Yeah, and he didn't realize the severity of it. Right, but he sure does now. And as a matter of fact, I saw him last night on the pregame of the halftime show of the Arizona-Seattle game. And he, he looked great. He sounded great. And I'm, I'm yeah. so happy for his success. Me too. I, I'm actually happy. Like, he – you know, he did his time. It is what it is. And I'm happy he was able to uh, have a have a good life afterwards because, you know what, he, he repented, like you said. And, you know, everyone makes mistakes. It sucks what he did. But I want to go back to really quick, if you don't mind. I'm sorry if I'm cutting you guys off over here. You mentioned yeah. Reggie White, right? And you mentioned the defensive line. Now, every defensive line – every de everyone knows the defense in the 90s with the Eagles. Clyde Simmons, Reggie White, like Eric – they were monsters. I want to ask, if you don't mind going into it, how it was when Jerome Brown, that incident happened. I know I didn't even have this written down, but you mentioned Reggie White. I just want to know if you could get into, like, how how much of a shock that was and how the team and how that day was. Well, I mean, he, oh, my goodness. I remember driving down when I heard about that. I drove mm -hmm. down to the, uh, to the stadium, and there was a Billy Graham crusade going on at the stadium that time. And I believe Reggie White was one of the speakers. And I remember the night and I remember the shock. I mean, nobody could believe it. It was, mm -hmm. it was just terrible because Jerome was one of the most, yeah. oh my God, irreverent, colorful people you have ever met. I mean, I remember I did a show from a restaurant in town called the Broadway Restaurant Bar. And at, it was a restaurant bar deli. And I asked Jerome Brown to do my show one night. And, you know, most of the players would, would order a sandwich on the way out. And Jerome went up to the counter and he said, I'll have four corned beef sandwiches and three roast beef sandwiches. And I said, geez, that's great. I'm glad you're getting together with some friends tonight. He said, no, <laughs> these are for me. <laughs> But, you, but bro, it, it's it's so tough to project how great he could have become. Yeah, because I know. he was some nose tackle. Yeah, but that was even like that defense. Like that's something the Eagles haven't had in years. Was even that linebacker crew of Byron Evans, Seth Joyner, like William Thomas, even like back then. Like it was a fearful defense, and you wonder yeah, they like were, they, they were awfully they were awfully good. You're right. You're right. Right. They were very good. But you know what? After Jerome died, it just I want to tell you something. After Jerome died and Bud Carson was the defensive coordinator, that next year, the defense without Jerome was number one against the run, hmm. number one against the pass, and number one overall. That might have been the best defense of all. Wow. There, yeah. yeah. Now, there's one – the one first memory I have, like I can remember as a kid, how crazy was it during the Fog Bowl? <laughs> can you even I see thought, to announce? I thought it was a smoke bomb. <laughs> and before you knew it, the whole field was shrouded in, in fog. And I could see absolutely nothing. If you were to turn around and look at a blank spot on your wall, that's what I saw. And, and like, in what? the second half, 
they brought a PA announcer with a wireless mic down the field, and he would say second and five, ball on the 32-yard line, and I would try to construct a game from that. And uh, it did the best I could. And um, it, it, was, it was an amazing experience. But I, it, whoever had the ball was going <laughs> to win the game because you couldn't do anything after that fog came in. And it's a shame because that was the best of Buddy's teams. Yes. That team, yes. I believe, under normal yeah. circumstances, would have, would have gone to and maybe won the Super Bowl. That, yeah. was, that was his best team. And the strangest thing was, number one, Buddy didn't make an excuse. When they came down to the locker room and asked Buddy if the game should have been stopped, he said no. He said, you don't stop wars. You just keep fighting. And then my wife and I always had a New Year's Eve party. And I was prepared to call her and say, hey, I won't be home tonight. We can't get out. The second I walked out of the tunnel <laughs> at Soldier Field into the parking lot, the sun was shining and it was the most crystal clear, beautiful late afternoon. Wow. Jesus. It was like it just settled over for the game. Yep. And Cunningham threw for what? Like 407 yards that game, too. And it, that, I, I, that I guess crazy. I didn't see any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did we. I, I, know, I, I know all I could do was try to be clever. I said at one point, uh, I can tell Randall Cunningham was having problems. He just came, he was just let out of the huddle by a German shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, 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 go on. What was more of a crazy game to announce, that one or the Snow Bowl in uh, 2014 when that blizzard just came out of nowhere, like in the beginning yeah. of the game? A another great one. Another great one. And, oh, um, I mean, just I, I don't know if you can see this. My fireplace is here. Can yeah, you yeah. see the picture? Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Is that McCoy yeah. jumping over yeah. someone? That, that's yeah. Jimmy McCoy yeah. jumping over the Lions. And what a great – First quarter, I couldn't see anything. It was like the football. Yeah. That's how thick it was. But fortunately, it dissipated, and it was a memorable game. Jeez. I, I, listen, I have questions here, and I know that, like, as a Cowboy fan, if anyone watches this as an Eagle fan, they're going to be like, look at this Cowboy fan, like, yeah. asking Merrill questions. So I'm going to hold mine off to the end. Nick, have you got any other ones, man? Oh, I, I mean, I can, I can go. Yeah, I can, we can sit for days. I don't want to, you know, I can, I, I can yeah. talk to Merrill for, forever. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to current. I just have two more current questions. Uh, it was announced today. Obviously, yesterday, uh, the Eagles had their share of COVID issues. Uh, J.J. Arcega, Whiteside, Corey Clement, Vinnie Curry. Uh, today was announced that Miles Garrett uh, is, is not playing in the game. And uh, you talk about – you know, five straight games, you know, unless Arizona just goes on, on a, a collapse, you're talking about five games in a row of six and three teams or, or higher. Uh, how big, I feel like this is an obvious answer question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. How important is this game and how big is the fact that Miles Garrett is not going to play in this game? Big and big. It, it's big that the Eagles, um, that, that the Eagles go out there and beat the Browns, and I think they're capable of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and number two, I think that uh, any time you take a superstar, you take the best defensive player, a game changer, out of the lineup, it's significant. But Cleveland will put somebody in there, so you still – you can't say, well, Miles Garrett is out. We're going to have a, a romp in the park. Nothing is a romp in the – nothing's a nope. picnic for this team. They've got to go out there and they've got to be good. Right. Uh, you no, know, we I was looking. I was looking at a couple years ago, and they were they were kind of in a similar boat. Uh, just around this time, uh, this was the year after they won the Super Bowl, uh, and they were four and six at this point, and, and kind of went on a run uh, to eventually make the playoffs. And then obviously we have the double doink and everything, mm -hmm. uh, and the rest is history. But you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to put the, some games together. I mean, at, you know, I, I am a betting man. I, I host a show with these guys on sports betting and. Uh, you know, to me, Cleveland's good at the run, and, and Philly's defense is great at stopping the run. Uh, well, I not know. statistically, but they yeah. are great at stopping the running backs. They've yes. given up a lot of yards yeah. to Daniel Jones and on jet <laughs> sweeps and things like that. But if you're talking about stopping the other team's top backs, they've done it. 
Now, these are the yeah. two. This is the best tandem, perhaps, yes. in the NFL in 24 Chubb and 27 Hunt. But they've got to be at their best. Yeah. I uh, my, my one last question is kind of uh, out of left field, I guess, com- you know, considering everything we've talked about. But, you know, I looked at a guy uh, like Jordan uh, Mailata. Do you think he deserves more playing time? He's done such a great job in the fill-in role for, you know, uh, Lane Johnson and everything. Do you think he deserves more playing time? Well, it's, it's not a matter of deserve. It's what Doug and uh, Jeff Statlin, the offensive line coach, feel is going to be the best combination to keep Carson Wentz upright. And yeah, right. right now they're not at the point where they're giving guys experience. They're trying to put their best combinations together. So they have Peters over a left tackle, and they're getting Siamalo back on Sunday. So uh, I think they're going to – and Lane Johnson is still there. So yeah. I think they're going to be okay. Nice depth. Merrill, nice depth, depth. Yeah, Merrill, uh, I have to ask, uh, if you don't mind, how do you – like, you know when uh, announcers have their niche, like Michael K here in New York City, see ya. Like, you're – it's good. Like – was there something you tried out while you were no. announcing? Nothing. It just came no. naturally. Well, you know what? Uh, whatever the year was, and it was in the in the eighties, uh, the Eagles were playing the Seahawks in Seattle. I will never forget that. The Eagles kicker was Roger Ruzik, and wow. the game the game went back and forth, and then and it had a lot of passes and incompletions. So it was a long game. And then they went into overtime. And it went to the last second of overtime. I mean, it seemed like we were there for three days. And with a second to go in overtime, Roger Ruzak stepped up for about a 48-yard field goal. And he kicked it. And I said, it's gone! It was the, <laughs> it was the relief that that game was was over. Wow. So I save it for game winners or 60 yard kicks or, or very significant kicks, but it's nothing. I don't really have catch phrases or right. in fact, if I, if I listen to tapes uh, and I do every summer and I say, what can I do to be better next year? I, I, I might say, you know what? I think I use that expression too much. Mm. Let's, let's not be repetitive. So I'm not somebody who believes in cliches or, anything like that. So it's just, it's good. Like it came, that was the title of my book. It's, yeah. it's G O O O O O O O D. <laughs> so uh, that was written about 10 years ago. Now, how, how hard has it been this year without fans to do the announcing? Like there's no energy to feed off of and you're not at the away game. So you're not getting like the feel of the game. Has it been uh, uh, like a tough adjustment or have you gotten used to it so far? Well, the tough adjustment is to go to the stadium this week and do a road game where I'm working with five different cameras and a director talking in my ear and my, my drop-ins, my commercials on another screen and my statistics on another screen and, and all 22 panoramic view. There's a million places and sometimes you're at the mercy of the director who doesn't always show the clock or when he comes back in a telecast and is focused someplace else and it isn't until the snap that you pick up the action and you don't know who was substituted in the, in the elapsed time. So that's tough. As far as the emotion is concerned, they are piping crowd noise into our headsets. And it's crowd noise collected or gathered by NFL films. So when you hear the crowd noise on our broadcast this Sunday, it is actually crowd noise that comes from the Brown Stadium at another sure. time. Yeah, it's actually what's saying. And you just hear that crowd noise and you react. Wow. That's interesting. Now, aside from the link, what is your favorite stadium to do a game in with the atmosphere? Like, what gives, like, has the best atmosphere to do an away game at? There's a lot of them from atmosphere. I have two favorite stadiums <clears throat> Lambeau Field, mm-hmm. because of the history because of the fans who greet you kindly in Green so Bay nice. when you They're come so up. Nice. They're so you nice. drive through the, the crowd, the homes, and yeah. there's just a, a special feeling. And you look down and you can, you can see the 
the con condensation coming out of Vince Lombardi's mouth, you know, before the, the ice ball, all these things. It's got so much tradition. So I love Ann Lambeau Field. But my favorite stadium in the National Football League oh boy. is MetLife. Really? Because really? I think that wow. is the best stadium. That is a great, big, wonderful stadium where everybody has a good seat. We are on the 50-yard line, and I love the fact, I love the fact that these gigantic scoreboards are on field level behind the players' benches, and you don't have to go like this or hunt around <laughs> after every play for the time and the distance and the score and all that stuff. So, but I think, I think hmm. that MetLife is really my favorite place to work. Great booth, great vantage point, great crowd. Everything about it, I love, and I love Lambeau Field. Those are my two favorites. No, I you could have wrote down. I could have wrote down the top, the thirty stadiums or thirty-one, whatever it is, you and never, that would have been really the last guess. Because if you listen to local sports radio here, oh, they, they hate it. Life Stadium. Why? <laughs> so, they, uh, they, I don't know. They just don't. We hate everything here. I, I they, don't know. They what think. I, I think that the biggest thing is that they think it's just plain and dull, and it doesn't. Yeah. I think Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a, a stadium shared by two teams. Mm -hmm. And there's well, no that's like that's true. That's true. But that's I have what to tell is. you something. You see, I, I, a, a big part of my evaluation is based not on the fans, but how we are situated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're right. practically in the end zone with an overhang. We can't see the scoreboard. The fans stand up and call us names. If they go past the 50, I can't tell if they pick up 16 yards or 16. It's awful. Pittsburgh, terrible in the end zone. Arizona, in the end zone. And I don't like any stadium with a roof. I like football outdoors. Yeah, what about, I'm with you on that. What about Dallas with the hole in the roof? What about that one? <laughs> you know, my son, Nolan, who works in Hollywood, he's a film editor. Uh, Nolan usually joins me on the road, and he comes to Dallas, and he calls that – a monument to excess. <laughs> no, I, I, I know, I know you're busy. We had to keep it, but I got like one more. In 01, 02, 03, you went to back to back to back uh, NFC championships, and you could argue that in 01 versus the Rams, the Eagles were actually the most in the game, even though they were huge underdogs. What was the one year? I can't believe I'm. I feel like an Eagle fan right now talking. To you. What, was the, what was the one year that you felt the city just like? Oh my God! Like their heart dropped after a like. Oh, when oh ever the ever Buccaneers. Was it two thousand and two when two thousand and two when they lost to Tampa Bay in the last game ever played at Veterans Day? I was there, <laughs> and yeah. nobody left that, the that stadium. Was supposed, that was supposed to be the yeah, last and because the Buccaneers had never won a game in temperature under whatever it was. Right. No, that. That was the old I mean, Brian time. Mitchell runs the kick 70 yards, and then Deuce Staley runs it in two plays later. The place is going nuts, and then – it and, vicious, baby. And then the pass to – the pass to Yeah, George and, the, and like, I, I'll never forget that because when the game ended, nobody left. We were just <laughs> sitting there like nobody wanted to leave. Yeah. <laughs> it was miserable. Yeah. Well, the, the, the problem was – that Donovan McNabb's favorite receiver yep. was Rondé Barber. For most of his career, too. Rondé Barber <laughs> killed him. Yeah, yeah. But Donovan was a great guy. One of the best quarterback in modern Eagles yeah. history. I agree. Uh, uh, Merrill, now you mentioned T.O. Who was the most hated opposition player aside from T.O.? Because obviously when T.O. came back in 06, listen, I was, I'm an asshole. I bought a T.O. jersey and I would wake, like, I'd walk out in the house wearing it in front of my brother as a cowboy jersey. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, who was the most hated opposition, like, person other than T.O.? You could really remember that. Oh, oh, that, that's, that's easy. That's easy. Michael oh. Irvin. Yeah. Oh. Okay. No, they're cowboy. Michael Irvin, who would jump up and signal first down. He'd <laughs> throw it in their face. Oh, all right. And, and it, one, I have one more, I swear to God, that I'm <laughs> uh, How under – I have to end with a cowboy thing. You as an Eagle fan, as an Eagle, as an Eagle announcer, you know football. How underappreciated was Tony Romo? I think he was – I think he was beloved by Dallas fans. But 
you know what? And and look, I, I he was a very very good quarterback, right? Very good quarterback, free agent, and yet look what he did in the playoffs. Right. His okay. playoff record was what he won one game in the playoffs, Two and, four, and that's right. what it's all about. Was he underappreciated? No, I think he was. I think he was appreciated, all right. but I don't think he was revered. He broke but he has the last laugh because he's making a zillion dollars a year from CBS. And he's great at it. Oh, how great is he, too? Very, yeah, he is very good. But he's also working with the wonderful Dance. Yeah. Well, you, Merrill, I can't thank you enough for this. Yeah, uh, Merrill, uh, I'm out of questions. Uh, we, I do, we do. I know Nick. Do you still have your uh, gun in your head questions? If you want to just go. I do or, actually. Yeah, I, I do. We do a fun segment at the end, just because we we do seriousness. It's kind of a would you rather. We just ask one or two questions, if you don't mind answering them. They're go ahead. Like, they're kind of quirky questions. All right, Nick, go first. Go ahead. Uh, my first, I obviously mine are going to be Philly based, so I guess my my first one would be Rocky Four against Ivan Drago. Or Cree two against uh, Victor Drago. <laughs> I didn't see either. Ah, wow! <laughs> I, 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 I saw I saw Rocky one against Apollo Creed. So we'll go with that. Yeah, we'll okay. go with that. We'll, we'll go with that one. All right, um, I'll, I'll go next. All right, one guy to return a punt for the game on the line: Brian Mitchell or Vi Sikahema. Brian Westbrook. All right. He wasn't even an option. I have, wait, wait, can I do it again? Deshaun <laughs> Jackson. Deshaun Jackson. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask because the miracle met me. The mir well, well, you know, there was another miracle of the Meadowlands. Yes. Westbrook. So that, was, that was the true number two. I was going to correct yep. Scott earlier when he mentioned yep. number two. I don't two. remember that, that one. Yeah, yeah. he almost West got West tackled, West. too. Yeah, yeah. He almost got and tackled. I liked Jeff Fiegel's on the play. Yes. Because I was going to – what was the more exciting call? Was that Miracle at the Meadowlands one or the second one with the Sean Jackson's punt return because of, like, what it meant for the season, too? Take your pick. Yeah, I mean, that second <laughs> one was – uh, the second one because of the way it occurred, but the first one, I was, I was dumbfounded. Yeah, I was numb. Why didn't they just kneel the ball? <laughs> I never amazing. understood that. Merrill, I have to say, I'm sure. Well, I the, who? Hey, see how good you are. My turn. Oh boy. Okay. I'm what not even fan. I'm exempt from this. Defensive coordinator. Well, what was the name of the Giants' offensive coordinator who was fired? By daybreak the next day. Oh, uh, which one? The Herb Evans one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson. See, all right, not, like, not that's the, not fair, Merrill. Not the, not the, <laughs> Bob, Bob Gibson. Not the, not the you, know, you guys know that the coach of the Giants was John McVay, Sean Mc, yeah, McVay's yeah. grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. How is, how is he? Have you ever met Sean McVay? Like, no, as a – like a young person being that age and being that successful as a yeah. NFL coach is amazing, ain't it? Yep. Merrill, uh, once again, I, I'm sure I speak for Nick and Ray. This was awesome. I could speak even as a Cowboy fan, man. Like I could speak for you for hours. I'm honored. This is going to be our Thanksgiving release, so I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I, I hope you and your family stay safe, man. Stay out of all the trouble. And uh, honestly, it was just an honor talking to you, buddy. Uh, Nick, I know, Raymond, I know you share the same sentiments here. Yeah, I, I just can't wait to do it. Hey, it was, like, it this was means a lot of so fun, much guys. To, I enjoyed it. We appreciate it a lot. Like, that, I, I am speechless, and I don't get like that often. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Well, it was fun. I will tell you this. Uh, if there are any Giants fans watching us tonight, um, I think the Giants are a team on the way up. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think I think Joe Judge, who I knew very little about before he was hired, I think he's doing a great job in New York. And I'll tell you something else. I also think that Daniel Jones is going to develop. And I felt that when he was coming out of Duke, I watched him in his college career. I think he is 
going to just get better and better. Who is your like current player? Who's your favorite to watch out of all the teams? Like to watch play football. Oh, there's no question about that. Lamar Jackson. Patrick Mahomes. Oh, that's right. what yeah, I was saying. Yeah. He, he has the chance to become one of the greatest we ever see if he stays healthy. Oh, he's, he's unbelievable. Oh, who is, who is, Andy, yeah. How happy is Andy Reid with Patrick Mahomes? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see him complaining too much. No. <laughs> he finally got his trophy. I, I was happy. For, like, when they won, what was your first reaction when the Chiefs won? Was it thinking I, like I was, you were happy? I was thrilled for Andy because I text yeah. back and forth right. with him after every game. Nice. Yeah, I was genuinely happy. I, listen, I'm lucky. I have a lot of friends. When, you, when you've been doing this thing for 44 years, I have a very good friend by the name of Mike Mayock, who is oh. as the general manager doing a great job in Las Vegas. Raiders, yeah. I have Correct. a good friend by the name of Sean McDermott, with whom I've golfed, who is yeah. doing a great job with the Buffalo Bill, just texted to him. So I have a lot of great friends. I'm lucky. You're forgetting yeah, three, yeah. though. Happy for You're all. forgetting three, Merrill. You have a great friend in me, Scott, Ray, and Nick now. So that's <laughs> three more great okay. friends. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Merrill. Well, uh, well, thank you, guys. I, I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun.